Hi, my name is Logan Seacrest, and I'm a criminal justice fellow at the R Street Institute. Uh, this is the second installment in our interview series on alternatives to arrest around the country. Um, if you could both just briefly introduce yourselves, that would be great. Sure. So I'm Dennis Weiner. Uh, I've been the chief of police for the Round Rock Independent School District for the last few months. And before that, I was assistant chief with the Palm Beach County School District Police in uh, Florida, where I was overseeing uh, field operations for the police department, as well as support uh, the support systems um, bureau. And in that capacity, I worked with our behavioral services unit, and we worked with the district's mental health uh, division, which is a separate department in that organization. Once I joined the Round Rock independent school district, I came into an organization that had integrated mental health services with the police department. Uh, and actually, Amy is one of my direct reports, and she manages the entire uh, mental health aspect of, of the district's efforts. And I'll turn that over to her. So, yes, I oversee a team of social workers here at the district. I got hired in January of 2020. Um, I was the first ever director in this position. It was um, a whole new department developing um, and then when the police department started in August 2020, I became part of the police department with the idea of how are we going to integrate um, officers and social workers together to ensure that we're meeting the holistic needs of students and that that's always been our number one goal or how do we serve the students in the best way possible. So this, since then, really building on my team, I have 14 um, under me now, um, 13 social workers, a coordinator, and so be able to oversee them. I do want to say this is my first time ever working in the police department, has been the last two and a half years. My background is mental health counseling. I was a mental health counselor for a number of years and then became part of the educational and how we um, integrate mental health services within education that, you know, hasn't always been um, as robust as I think it's starting to become now. Yeah, one of the reasons R Street was interested in speaking with you both is because of that holistic approach you take to serving students. Um, do you have a really interesting collaboration, like you said, between school resource, resource officers and behavioral health specialists that I think we think provides an important alternative to arrest when uh, kids get in trouble. So could you kind of describe that uh, collaboration in more detail and how it works? Sure. So our officers and our social workers right from the very beginning are fully integrated. What that means is that uh, Amy sits on our panels for hiring and I collaborate with her on her hires as well. Um, but then after the hire, we train those uh, individuals together. So our police officers and our mental health uh, professionals uh, train jointly. And what happens during that training is not only do they get the same training at the same time, but they also begin to build trust between the two professions, which is vitally important for having the, uh, the effort succeed. Now, and I would agree, and even beyond that, that it happens at that level, but I think it happens at the officer and social worker level because of the collaboration that happens at our level that um, often when we talk about our model, people are like, well, how often do you collaborate with the chief of police? And I'm like, daily, hourly, like the decisions we make um, are very much together. And we see that there were two parts of, um, that are of the same coin. We often get asked, or I've gotten asked, well, couldn't you do the same even if you were outside of the department and you were um, with, reporting to the chief of police. And I can wholeheartedly say it would not work as seamlessly as it works if we were an outside department. Uh, many organizations and especially school um, uh, police departments, that is the model they work off of, right? Like here's the police department and here's other mental health um, aspects within the district, but they're not as um, seamlessly integrated as ours. And that's because we are within the same. And, and the reason why that works so well is because not only do, to, do Amy and I work on the policy and strategic level to make sure programs are benefiting um, but and how they're supported by both the police and mental health, but you'll see it in the field between the social workers and the officers when, they're, when they co-respond to situations. There's a little bit of a, a give and take that happens as the two, the two members of the team figure out who should take the lead who should be in a supporting role, and it may change roles over the over the engagement. So it may start out as a mental health engagement and then turn into a law enforcement engagement, or it could reverse. And so the benefit of having them both on station at the same time with the same experience and training 
is that they perform seamlessly toward a, toward a common goal, which is a positive outcome for the student. Great, thank you. Um, one thing I was wondering about is how did Round Rock decide to make these kinds of alternatives to arrest a, a, a goal? Like, how did the collaboration come about? And it, did you design it based on some kind of evidence-based practice or, or some specific model uh, that you saw elsewhere? So the district started on a journey of discovering what is the best options um, for us and what is meets the needs of the district. And I think that's the critical thing is that all of this has been developed out of what are the needs for Round Rock ISD. And the safety and security task force was formed with community members, stakeholders, expertise in lots of different areas. Um, in it, they decided that forming our own police department was critical, but they also said that was critical with the lens of we understand that oftentimes in a lot of what we see by research and statistics and things is that sometimes um, certain groups of students are disproportionately impacted with police presence on campuses. So we've got to keep that in mind. And then we also have to keep in mind the mental health needs of students, that a lot of times students um, are getting in trouble because of underlying mental health concerns. And we can't criminalize that. We can, but it's the wrong thing to do if we want students to be successful and graduate and become members of, of society. And so I, that laid the basis for how we would do um, this model. And I would love to say it was some great, we, we, we detailed it out from the beginning. It didn't, it organically happened. When I was hired as the director of behavioral health services, I was within safety and security. And so it started a lot of these conversations and seeing how it all forms together. And then I, I can 100% say since we've started developing it, we just started our third year, it has been the best decision. And that we see every day that students are positively impacted because of the way in which we're approaching um, school policing. At, at its core, the things that we value as an organization from the police department's perspective is we're guided by four core values of, of safety and security, equity, uh, student advocacy, and behavioral health uh, support. And so with regard to specifically the student advocacy, what we find is that um, opposed, as opposed to traditional SROs coming in from outside agencies and providing a law enforcement presence, what we actually do is we uh, actively advocate uh, for the success of the student. And what that means is that we take every engagement with the, uh, with the goal of making sure the student doesn't end up on the pathway to criminal justice services, but rather has the wraparound services and the interventions needed earlier on to make sure that the student has a successful outcome from the K-12 K experience. And so it may turn out originally to be a, a law enforcement response that would end up in an involuntary commitment. What happens is law enforcement responds in partnership with mental health counselors and, and social workers. And then we work as a team to get to the re resolution that we prefer to have, which is a voluntary um, uh, visit to a mental health facility where the services can be provided. And that's better for all parties involved. Why do you think it is so important to keep kids out of the criminal justice system if possible? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of uh, perspectives on that. One is the the perception that law enforcement it participates in the school to prison pipeline activities when they're on campus. And so whether or not that's true in some places, it's, it's not true here. And I think that's where we distinguish ourselves from that uh, that stereotype, if you would. So what happens here is that our officers um, are, are uh, committed to the, the aspect of preventing a, a, a student um, from going into the criminal justice system in any way possible. Now, sometimes the students don't leave us with any alternatives, but um, with that exception in mind, uh, we always look to prevent them or def uh, defer them from going into criminal justice uh, services. And so you don't see that kind of advocacy happening with most other law enforcement agencies. And SROs that report to a municipal police department or a sheriff's office, they may be on the campus physically present, but their philosophy is not one of school-based philosophy where um, the, student, the best student outcome is what's uh, most important. What I would even say with that, by us having our own police department, chief is one of the chiefs of the district, right? So we have like a chief of teaching and learning, chief of schools and innovation. So they all meet together. So the chief of police of our school district's police department is in all the conversations about all aspects 
of education. And so we're really in an invested part of knowing that what happens on our side in our area impacts the learning that happens, impacts a student graduating, impacts what jobs a student has later in life. I think a lot of times we we think just immediate and not the long term. You know, students do that all the time because their brains aren't fully developed. They can't really think far out. And so how do we help not criminalize a juvenile behavior when we have other options for um, consequences and different things in assistance so that that student can have a bright future? We don't want something, one mistake that happens in high school or even middle school, stopping their career trajectory for the rest of their life. And so we put a face on, on the issues, right? And so our philosophy is if we can help change the, the outcome of an individual student um, in many cases, then that will, as an aggregate will help the performance levels of the, of the district as a whole. But we start from the individual where a lot of the programs on the academic side are looking at the, the group as, as, a, um, as a population. Great. Can you can you walk me through how this uh, just kind of functions on, on the ground, so to speak? Uh, let's say, say you get a, a call about an incident in a school. Wh who takes it? Where does it go from there? And I think it depends on the nature of the call. Um, you know, our social workers, um, officers can call them at any point, right? Officer would get a call about something. They can immediately go to them um, type of thing. But our social workers daily are working other case um, um case files and stuff, uh, referrals from school counselors, principals, AP, so that for, sort of preventative, like let's know about students and how do we help them. But a huge part of, for us, is that our officers are out on campus all the time. Right? They don't sit in an office. <laughs> They're not just sitting in a car. They're engaging with students all the time. And so a lot of our referrals for social workers aren't because there's criminal activity that an officer sees. It's that officers have formed relationships with students and then students talk to them and then they're like, oh my gosh, the student needs more help than what I'm trained to give. I'm going to go take them down to the social worker down the hallway because I know they can assist them. And so it is, it's this whole idea of prevention and not waiting for a student to get in trouble. You know, our, our officers know the kids, they go to their basketball games, they go to their plays, they, um, are really invested because they care about what happens with the student um, in their life. Um, most of them got into this work because they wanna help students' lives. They come to our police department because they know we're trying to do it differently and they long for an opportunity to do a different type of policing that can be proactive and can have that lasting impact. We've also um, have started um, providing our, uh, we have two social workers that are critical incident response social workers, and they have particular training that we felt would be uh, um, applicable to uh, respond with officers on immediate uh, situations where students are in crisis. And so they actually are, um, and will be monitoring our radio system so that they can hear calls for service coming out to the officers, and they can assess those situations as they're hearing them um, being articulated over the radio and decide whether or not they may be able to add value uh, to the response, and in which case they are free to respond with the officers and to provide additional assistance on the scene. Yeah, I mean, that's that's great to hear. I think sometimes in the juvenile justice system, we can be so reactive that uh, it sounds like your model is really uh, a way to, to head off problems before they begin. So so that's, that's really great. Um, what would you say some challenges uh, have been that you've encountered in uh, in forming this partnership and this collaboration? I think sometimes too, it, it, it is just because we can arrest doesn't mean we should arrest. And sometimes that's a hard mindset set, a mind shift for some of our, um, not our officers, but even more, you know, administrators and stuff because they're not used to that. They're used to, okay, we call the police and then the kid goes. And us saying, hold on a second, that's not necessarily gonna be, let, let's talk this through. Let's, let's really look at this. And so I think sometimes it's even educating um, our educators on a different model of policing because that's not what many of them are used to after so many years of education. Yeah, one of the cool things that I, I read about your program is that you've uh, started to incorporate uh, 
uh, dog therapy dogs and service animals. Can you tell me more about that aspect of, of uh, your efforts? Yeah, so we've got um, therapy dogs that we utilize uh, both uh, proactively and reactively in the field. And so we are uh, building toward a capacity of five therapy dogs. Uh, we currently have a few out in the field. And my experience with my last district, um, having uh, first-hand observations of successes there. I was a big believer in the program, and I was happy to find that they had one established here, which was actually even a little more robust. And so here we work toward not only providing those engagement opportunities ad hoc whenever we can get to a campus with, with, the, um, with the animals, but those dogs are really something we're looking to in the future inject into actual therapy programs where specific children may be uh, helped on a regular basis with the dogs to help them with their anxieties, to help them with their stressors, and to help them just um, uh, associate more comfortably with the school environment. And then we also use them as a reward mechanism. So if the behavior is positive for a week, they get some time to spend with the dog the following week. And so we found that to be highly um, advantageous in changing behavior. It is a nice way to um, introduce police officers at times to students that maybe have had a negative experience. Because some of our students have had a negative experience or their families have. And so to see a therapy dog, because most of the time when you see a dog with an officer, it's a, it's a drug dog, a bomb dog, like probably many others that I'm not aware of <laughs> and that you're not allowed to touch. And it's more of a punitive kind of thing where these are dogs, they're supposed to be pet, like you pet the dog so you can engage. And so I think even with that, it's really helped some of those relationships um, in seeing the the I always say we humanize our officers, right? That they're not an officer, they're a person who is an officer. And I think that there will be dogs that definitely help with that. So what advice would you give to a law enforcement agency or a school district trying to start up a similar program to what you've got going on in Round Rock? I think it's really important to get the right people um, on your team. Uh, they have to have the right philosophy. They have to understand what the expectations are or the mission is, right? Mm -hmm. So that they're, we're, we're all pulling in the same direction. That's really uh, important. And then to really have a successful program for intervention, uh, you know, here in Round Rock ISD, we use a threat assessment tool that's required by the state, but we use it um, very vigorously now to really try to uh, empower our administrative and educational staff to help us identify those students that may be falling into a pathway to violence or may, may be having coping issues or maybe having adjustment issues where we can provide mental health services at a much earlier point where those services have been shown to be much more effective and, and with a broader scope of available resources earlier on. Once the student moves down a pathway to violence and they're toward the planning or operational phases, our, our resources are rather limited. You know, it's going to be law enforcement and some maybe very aggressive mental health services, but um, but it's, it's not as easy to engage with family counseling, student counseling, all the wraparound services that may be available once once a certain point is hit. I'll also say, just echo what she said about getting the right people. Um, it, it can't just be that I, we have a few officers and then we have social workers and we're just going to plop them all together. That it really does take people from the top that really buy into the philosophy and not just by words, but by in actions too. You know, it takes people from both sides kn knowing that they only know they're experts in their one area, right? Like, I, I can't come in and tell them how to police. I, I don't have that training. That's not my expertise. I have to respect and value the expertise of those I'm working with. And I, I don't think that happens with everybody. And no fault, right? It's just our, our different experiences. We've had different paths in life. But I do think it really takes a achieve who wants this model and trust this model, but then it takes other leaders within the department to also fully buy in and be willing to learn and grow. Um, I learn every day new things because um, I've not ever been exposed to this. And so we're constantly being challenged and that we have to be willing then to readjust what we're doing. Just because it worked last year, it doesn't mean we can't make it better this year and continuing to do that. And so you have to have that mindset that will continue to evolve. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a, a perfect place to, to wrap up. Um, really appreciate your time today. It's a really cool model that you guys have developed. And I just hope more uh, school districts and, and law enforcement agencies around the country 
can learn from you, learn from what you've done there in Round Rock. It's it's really awesome to see. Thank Great. you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it.